Hello, and welcome to the lecture on psychological realism. In this lecture, we'll be using the stories of Araby and the yellow wallpaper to explore how psychological realism differs from traditional realism, which we studied last week. We'll also be learning terms like limited perspective and talking about how psychological realism focuses on the movement of a character's mind. For the past week, we have focused our study on realism. We are moving away from realism and towards fantasy in this unit because we position those two things as opposite extremes, even though, as we'll see this week, there's a lot of overlap. So this week we will look at a hybrid form that blends realism with fantasy, but the fantasy comes through the main character's perspective and psychology. Last week we got to hear characters' thoughts, but we still saw a lot of the action of the stories as external to the characters. This week we are inside someone's head, getting a narrative from one person's perspective, rather than outside being told about the character by a narrator as we saw in the necklace. This difference in perspective marks the use of fantasy because we have to rely on the characters in the, st in the story to determine what is real about the world. Stories that use psychological realism still use many of the realist qualities that we learned last week. For example, an author wants the story to feel as real as possible to readers and uses a lot of details and description in order to make this happen. However, the realness that the author focuses on may be the movement of the character's mind rather than the description of the external world. In psychologically realist stories, we are meant to ask, has the author created a realistic portrait of someone's psychology? Or, do the character's thoughts feel believable within the world of the story? In both stories that we read for this week, the drama or action of the story is completely interior. Both James Joyce and Charlotte Perkins Gilman use the psychology of their characters to examine serious issues, another hallmark of the realist tradition. So let's start with Joyce and Araby. James Joyce is one of the most famous modern writers in the world. He is Irish, although he left Ireland at a young age and spent most of his life in continental Europe. He is best known for the portrait of an artist as a young man and Ulysses, two novels, though he also wrote poetry, short fiction, and plays. Joyce's philosophy as a writer was that the drama of the mind could provide just as much conflict and action for readers as any external event. He created a literary technique called the epiphany, which is where a character experiences a very mundane event, but has a moment of intense self-revelation because of it. When he wrote short fiction, he often tried to dramatize epiphanies in his characters' minds in order to show how psychological action could provide conflict. We can see this philosophy at work in Araby. In this story, there is not much external action at all. In fact, it can be summed up rather quickly. A young boy has a crush on his friend's sister and wants to go to Araby, which is a bazaar, to buy her a gift. He gets to go, but he doesn't end up buying her a present. He witnesses a flirtation between a salesgirl and two men, and this mundane moment results in his epiphany about his own vanity. The realistic qualities of, of this story begin with all of the vivid details Joyce includes. You can see these in the opening paragraphs. The pages of the priest's books are curled and damp. The color of the sky is ever-changing violet, and the rain falls like fine, incessant needles. These are just a few quick examples of the many details that Joyce includes. However, we need to remember that the interior perspective of the narrator determines all of these details too. Importantly for psychological realism, the boy who speaks this story is the one who provides these descriptions. We can see that he is very imaginative because he envisions himself almost like a knight, paying tribute to Mangan's sister who he thinks he loves. This emphasis on the boy's psychological condition, 
His way of seeing the world is important to the conclusion of the story and marks this story as psychologically realistic. We can see the internal conflict the boy experiences as he waits to go to Araby. He can't concentrate on his schoolwork. He can't think of anything else. This is the drama of the story. It's very small, but doesn't it seem realistic? Have you ever been distracted by someone or something to the point of an emotional agony? Importantly, the conclusion of the story involves the boy's realization of his own psychological condition. When he witnesses a common flirtation, he has an epiphany, an interior moment of action that results in self-revelation. The story ends with his own knowledge of his vanity. He had spent hours and days thinking about a girl, assuming that he was doing something noble by going to Araby and bringing her back a gift. But the flirtation shows him that all the interaction with her has been in his mind, and he is angry with himself. With, while this is a simple plot, Joyce believed that the movement of his character's minds shows how real life works. We all have these moments of self-reflection and realization as we grow and mature. Moments when we recognize that life or people are not as we thought they were. For Joyce, dramatizing these moments was an important act as a writer. Now let's look at the yellow wallpaper and Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Our second story this week uses psychological realism for critique. Charlotte Perkins Gilman was an American author that was interested in women's rights during, during the early 20th century. She used the yellow wallpaper in particular to critique women's lack of agency over their own health. The story is somewhat autobiographical. If you've read the story already, you know that the text is supposed to be written by a woman that has been prescribed a rest cure. This means that the doctor, who is also her husband, thinks that the narrator needs bed rest and as little stimulation as possible in order to recover from a nervous breakdown. The story is told from the perspective of the narrator's diary entries, so this forces us as readers into a limited perspective. We have to trust the narrator's depiction of all events since we can't see the world from outside the diary. In this case, Gilman uses realism to create a realistic tone for the narrator. She tries to recreate a person's thought process. The realism, then, is supposed to come from the movement of the narrator's mind, just like in Joyce and Araby. But Gilman does this more literally by presenting us fragments of narration, ostensibly recorded in the diary. See, for example, where the narrator writes, I don't know why I should write this. I don't want to. I don't feel able. In addition to events in the story, she also tells us her mental state, and this contributes to the perspective and the tone of the story. Since we watch the narrator of the yellow wallpaper descend further into mental illness, we have to ask why Gilman would choose madness if she wanted readers to understand her critique about women's rights. The mad tone of Gilman's narrator serves several functions. But the most important is that madness functions as an effective disguise for offering social critique. Because we are actually supposed to take some of the narrator's words seriously, the story deals with the contradiction of madness. The narrator tries to make a logical observation about society, but she has become paranoid, so we can't totally accept her observations as valid. We have to trust her point of view by entering her alternate perspective. In doing so, we stand outside of a culture that wants us to conform to, trad to traditions. So, by understanding the story, we actually end up seeing things like the narrator wants us to. We learn to see beyond a com confining cultural perspective. Keep in mind the form of this story. We are limited by this point of view, which makes us also, perhaps, feel suspicious about our perspective. This limited point of view should make you raise questions about the text. What does it feel like to be forced to receive all our information from the perspective of a paranoid person? How can we trust the narrator? How are we supposed to make meaning of a text in which meaning itself is under dispute? Remember, 
both of this week's stories fall somewhere between fantasy and realism because we are getting all the details of the story from a narrator's perspective or mind. This is the main difference between traditional realism, told externally, even if you see or hear some of the character's thoughts, and psychological realism, which focuses on how real the movement of the mind can be. Keep this distinction in mind as you continue to learn about modes in this unit. Thanks.